Welcome. Thank you, Mike. Great to have you here. Wendy, Ahmed, Annette, looks like the whole gang is here. Jacobo, I think we're ready to go. Perfect, uh, Mike, uh, thank you very much. So for for the for the audience, thank you very much for joining us, uh, especially after uh, after after a very interesting sessions that we have had like this morning. Um, after the lunch, uh, we were thinking in in launching this session and um, just thinking that if uh, Indiana Jones is able to actually do his own sequel like many many years ago. <laughs> Uh, and then repeat it today in the cinema and have a, a success or partial success, I think that we can always have a, a, a nice uh, session about the Forgotten Ball. So that's why we are here. I think um, the Dreykatsky Ball is uh, almost uh, everywhere forgotten about, like uh, most of the guidelines don't talk about it. And I thought it was actually an interesting discussion. And, and we tried to brought in like uh, very specific uh, members of the international community to actually be able to, to, to give us like a, a feedback. But uh, from the Toronto group, I think Mike is going to introduce our lecturers. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's going to be a, a great discussion. So with uh, no far dilatation, um, uh, we will review the a couple of clinical cases just to prime the session. Uh, I will show the cases with you. We will not discuss the cases, then we will go to the presentations. And uh, and then we will, in the Q&A, uh, talk about what we will do with those cases and open um, the mics for the for the attendees to be able to actually do the, the Q&A. So, um, Mike, um, I'm going to actually start with the cases, OK? And then we will talk about the, the panelists after, OK? Just very quickly and sharing my screen here. There we are. Perfect. Um, okay, so session three, tricuspid valve. We are going to be talking about decision making and I'm just presenting a couple of clinical cases uh, um, regarding like uh, the presence of tricuspid regurgitation when we do uh, surgery for the mitral valve or when we do other surgeries and how, how the, the team thinks that uh, we should actually act in those situations. Um, okay, I have no conflicts of interest to discuss uh, with the audience. And as, uh, as we just discussed, that's what we are going to be talking regarding the objectives uh, of this presentation. So to start, like uh, the first case that we have is a 59-year-old woman that was actually presented to our hospital with a heterotaxis syndrome. If uh, some of the audience are not familiar, it's uh, normally like a normality where the internal thoracic or abdominal organs, uh, they have an, a different arrangement on the left to right axis of the body. Um, this lady presented with atrial fibrillation, severe degenerative mitral valve, and in the echo report from the pre-operative period, uh, and it was actually done uh, no more than two months before the surgery. The report was that she presented with mild PR. So we went into the case, and as we started to actually examine, you can um, see the pathology in the mitral valve, but that's what no, we are not interested. We can we can actually see this modified four chamber view where we can see uh, the amount of uh, tricuspid regurgitation that we have. So if we pay a closer look, we got a vena contract of 0.5. Uh, we did the RVSPs of 29. We measured the PSA radius. We did our calculations. And at the end, we got a vena contract of 0.5, a PSA radius of 0.6, a calculated effective regurgitation orifice of 0.4, and a regurgitation volume of 32 minutes. We went a little bit uh, farther to analyze the tricuspid valve. So we went into the 60 degree angle and then we got those pictures. We keep uh, screening through the valve. We go to the 90 degrees angle and that's the amount of TR that we have here. And again, been a contract almost 0.5, RBSP is a little bit elevated with a better uh, plane alignment. Uh, we did uh, again the PISA radius, and basically we obtain almost the same uh, the same numbers in a modified by cable at 110 degrees. Probably you can see 
that the, the amount of uh, TR is significant and how this uh, tricuspid valve uh, looks. And again, we repeat our measurements, the mean gradient through the valve was zero. We went into the hepatic vein and then we got a uh, systolic reversal and we assessed the valve uh, in 3D. And what we could see is this uh, mark adaptation of the posterior leaflet and the jet septally director. So this is the first case. We are not going to comment anything on that case until we finish the presentations. And then we are going to go quickly with the second case that we are going to present. This is a second case will be like a liver transplant candidate, uh, 67 uh, female uh, end stage liver disease, secondary to fulminant hepatic failure, hypertension, chronic kidney disease. The DE pre uh, showed like an asymmetric left ventricular hypertrophy, like a Saturn uh, 50 millimeters, normal EF, with uh, post valve like a uh, huge gradients and SAM, uh, right ventricle that was normal, and a trivial tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, this was done probably four months before the transplant. So the indication for intraoperative TE in this liver transplant was intraoperative monitoring because of the SAM and the gradients and the asymmetric left ventricular hypertrophy. So when we went into the case, those were, those were our first pictures. As you can see, uh, this ventricle, how thick it is. Um, the patient was uh, appropriately beta block at the time. And then as you can see, there is no SAM here. Uh, interestingly though, when we put color, uh, we see that despite not having that thumb, we still have uh, some mitral regurgitation. We went in to assess the right ventricle. And as you can see here, this right atrium is massive. If you pay attention to the intralateral septum is bulging towards the left every single time that this atrium is uh, filling. So we went there, the tricuspid annulus was only 3.5 in this patient. And then there was no PFO, but you can see how this septum is bulging every single time that the regurgitation from the tricuspid valve, which is quite significant in, in this case. So we did our measurements. Uh, the vena contracta was up to two centimeters. Uh, RVSP is uh, estimated around like uh, 44. And again, we take more pictures, like we increase our angle to 60. We assess the amount of regurgitation that we have here. We don't even need to, to move the baseline to see that there is flow convergence in this, uh, in this jet. And again, uh, the radius was 1.1 for the PISA radius in the TR. And then when we did the calculations, the effective regurgitan orifice is 1.3 centimeters to the square and the regurgitan volume 60 milliliters uh, um, compatible with severe tricuspid regurgitation. We went into the liver, check, and obviously there was systolic flow reversal in the paddy veins. And post on clamp, after the, the liver was in place, we reassess uh, again the tricuspid regurgitation. We still have like a massive uh, vena contracta, systolic uh, flow regurgitation from the hepatic veins. And Going up in different angles, we still have what we consider severe TR. Same calculations, the error here was 0.7, um, but no matter what, like regurgitation volume 55, I still consider this severe. So we are going to stop here, get those cases into the back of your mind. We are going to go ahead with the presentations and Mike is going to introduce um, the speakers now. Thanks so much, Jehovah. That's terrific. Um, always great to have cases to uh, get ourselves uh, um, thinking about the topic. Um, and I really want to say thank you to the audience for sticking with us for the last session of the day. Um, it is great to have you here. Uh, Dr. Moreno's curated an excellent program on the evaluation and intervention decision-making regarding the trust, tricuspid valve. And it's going to be my pleasure to introduce our speakers to you.